jump right into the 3GPP technologies that have come to the forefront of the LP WAN space. Um, the first is LTE CAT M1. And what LTE M CAT 1 is, is LTE, like 4G LTE, which is um, just like you're familiar with your handset. Um, they've taken uh, the 20 megahertz um, spectrum from LTE and they've said, we can operate a lower data rate connection with inside one resource block in one time interval, which gives you a much simpler front end that only has to digitize 1.4 megahertz of spectrum versus a whole 20 megahertz spectrum and allows the device to have only one antenna. And what that means is, is you can have a much simpler and less expensive chipset. Um, it's half duplex, meaning it only has half, half the processing power because it's never transmitting and receiving at the same time. And then 3GPP actually, as part of release 12 and 13, um, standardized two power saving features that have been really critical to um, driving the types of long battery lives that could be achievable on CAT M1. The first is power saving mode. And this is where the device uh, can tell the base station or tell the network that it's going completely dormant and going right down to idle uh, for an un undetermined amount of time as long as it wakes up once a day um, to check in and tell the network that it's still alive and still healthy. Um, you know, you can get idle currents down to just a, a few microamps, um, and you're right in the same power budget as Sigfox or everybody else. Obviously, when you're transmitting for LTE CAT M1 today, that can be up to 23 dBm, which is quite a bit of power, actually, for these devices, which does necessitate things like super caps or a little bit bigger batteries than maybe like a 14 dBm Sigfox device might need but still very power efficient because the time on air at a megabit per second is so short compared to 300 bits per second where you might have to transmit for many seconds at a time. And the other, uh, the other innovation for CAT M1 is extended discontinuous reception or EDRX, which means I need the ability to reach from the server or from the network side down to a device uh, asynchronously and, and send commands. This might be a streetlight controller, I might need to wake up the device for firmware transfers, et cetera. And really the innovation here is allowing the node to tell the network how many hyper frames of 10.24 seconds it wants to sleep period, periodically, which could be up to 40 minutes at a time. So it allows your device to be pageable without transmitting up to 40 minutes in between, which is very, very power efficient because those paging windows are very short and you're not transmitting in those windows, you're just maintaining a sync with the network. And there is a, a, a periodic check-in where the device does have to transmit so that the base station knows it's still connected. Um, some advantages of, of LTE CAT M1 for the class of devices that we deal with, which are you know battery powered, sensors, controllers, or other devices, is that you have very good US-based coverage coming very soon. Um, in you know, Q1 of next year, Verizon AT&T will have um, LTE Cat M1 coverage uh, nationwide. Everywhere where, LTE, everywhere where LTE works, Cat M1 will work as well. This includes in buildings, on DAS systems, in urban areas, rural areas, uh, et cetera. Obviously, there needs to be 4G coverage uh, for the system to work. It's not gonna work out in the middle of nowhere where 4G hasn't been built up, but if you look at the Verizon coverage map, you'll see that there's actually very few places where that's true. Another advantage of the system is that you can connect directly to the TCP IP network, which really means that your device is, for all intents and purposes, right on the internet, right there at the edge. So you can connect direct from that device to any server you like and vice versa, which is very powerful architecture. And with really fast data rates, relatively speaking, at a megabit per second, you can do so much more than you can do with a, with a simpler, um, you know, traditional LP WAN device, which might be limited to a kilobit per second or less. And these devices can be very power efficient. When you couple the high data rate with the low idle currents, uh, your power budgets are right there where they are with every other technology that we're talking about today. To compare it quickly to narrowband IoT, which is another standard that I'll talk about next, you know, there actually is better uplink power utilization than narrowband IoT because the on-air data rate is so much faster. You're transacting uh, faster, so your time on air is shortened. 
when when pretty much any of these devices are transmitting, they're not any more power efficient than any other one. They're all using, you know, a class E chip scale amplifier or something like that, which is drawing a pretty standard amount of, you know, milliwatts per, you know, dBm of power being transmitted. Some considerations, though, if you're considering LTE CAT M1 for your application, is that that power budget is really yours to manage. You have to, as the application designer, think about putting the device into PSM, putting it in EDRX, and managing the architecture so that you're not needlessly draining the device. Um, and this is something that um, we at Link Labs really focus on with our M1 devices, uh, trying to make that even easier for customers. Another thing is that carrier firmware upgrades do get pushed down over the air to the modem without your control at all. And during that transaction, you're burning power as you're you know, receiving packets, running a bootloader, rebooting, um, and you have no control over that uh, really as a customer. So early on, I would expect that features and things are going to be changing. So there will be some cycles uh, for, for, for FOTA, but it's not, I don't think, going to really eat into the power budget significantly. Again, I've said there's areas with limited coverage. Um, there's no denying that, but obviously there is no LP WAN technology that's deployed anywhere close to what 4G is deployed, uh, at least in this country. Excuse me. Um, and then, you know, system costs are going to be slightly higher than other LP WAN technologies. Uh, these are sophisticated chipsets. You need SIM cards, a separate microcontroller, level shifters, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you have to implement uh, LP or IPsec or IP security on your device. You're on the internet, and if you're, you need to manage the ability of that device to either connect, um, you know, or to not accept connections from the internet, not get scanned. You might want to use a VPN or, or some uh, carrier service to help with that. And then you have the IPR risk or the IP risk that comes um, with using uh, 3GPP technology. There's a lot of licensed. Um, patents and other things that are a part of implementing 4G. And you know the companies out there that, that license those patents will probably want to make money off your successful uh, Cat1 deployment, which is why you know buying finished systems or buying modules that have IP protection uh, could be important. Finally, you need to consider certification. Um, you know What we sell at Link Labs for M1 is already carrier and 3GPP certified, but if you go out and, and start at the module level, you need to budget for the time and the cost of getting a carrier certified. I think it will be a simpler and cheaper process than has been the case for Cat1 technology before, but still something to consider. All right, some key takeaways for the M1 technology. It will be available especially, uh, definitely by mid-2017, if not earlier, nationwide in the U.S. Definitely not going to be deployed um, in other parts of the world as quickly. Um, you know, there aren't 4G deployments in other parts of the world, which is why the narrowband IoT technology that I'm going to get into might, might be deployed there first. It provides a very power-efficient data transport at relatively high speeds. And the module costs are probably going to be in the $15 range, and data for hundreds to hundreds of kilobytes to a megabyte or two will be in the $1 to $3 a month range, which is pretty reasonable for a lot of use cases. Um, but, and as we'll talk about, there, there are use cases that still can't afford that, and that's where other, other technologies make more sense. Um, I think it's definitely important to look for CAT-M modules and chips that are designed specifically for CAT-M and don't require a larger like Linux environment to be booted up for you know 20 seconds when you're coming out of power saving mode because that'll just burn up your battery. Um, we at Link Labs are partnered with Sequans on their chipset for LTM and really, really happy with the uh, power performance we're seeing from that. Just a, a quick uh, shameless plug about the Link Labs uh, solutions in LTM. We are certifying through PTCRB and Verizon um, a communication board, which is this top board, which has the LTM chipset and a host microcontroller with an open source project where our customers can write their application specific code and run their code against a simple API uh, to you know, push and pull data uh, from their server. Um, this board underneath is an open source design for sensor and power boards where you can have anything from GPS, uh, you know, IO sensors, you know, there's a whole gamut of sensors and power um, that you can implement underneath, which um, we think is going to be a really great out of the box experiment uh, experience for customers. Um, you know, just quickly, we're looking at, we're doing this communication host board and LTEM, you know, soon we'll be supporting narrowband IoT. And that, of course, also supports our core product, uh, which I'll get into later, which is Symphony Link. That plugs into this open source power and sensor board, which could be battery powered, solar powered, 
DC powered, AC powered. Um, and we have a, you know, a growing array of sensors that can plug into that. And then they fit into standard enclosure, both indoor and outdoor, that could be customized uh, quickly to add things like connectors, buttons, labels, et cetera. You know, white labeling is a big uh, important piece of what we're doing as well. And then on top of that, we have the option to do subscription and data and device management uh, for LTEM to implement things like, um, you know, handling, addressing, uh, you know, payload control signals and firmware to devices that are sleeping a lot, that's, that's complicated, handling firmware upgrades, um, and then just managing and pooling large uh, pools of uh, subscription to Verizon and AT&T is, uh, is a valuable thing, especially for some of our smaller customers. All right, so that's LTEM. I'm sure, Glenn, uh, I'm sure there's a few questions trickling in over